In a new piece for The Guardian, founder of The Lever, David Sirota, makes the case that the Democratic Party's rightward lurch ahead of 2024 is a dangerous play for President Biden's reelection strategy. This comes as new CNN polling shows just one third of Americans say Biden deserves to be reelected in 2024. The largest shift comes among younger adults, just 25 percent of whom say Biden deserves another term in the survey. That's down from 36 percent in December. Joining us now to weigh in is founder of The Lever and editor at large of Jacobin, David Sirota. Hello, David. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So we've been talking a lot about the uh, slipping poll numbers of Joe Biden, especially relative to the two primary challengers he has now on paper, uh, Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr., uh, putting up, you know, not totally unrespectable uh, numbers. You know, so many voters saying that they definitely don't want another clash between Biden and Trump, even though it seems likely they'll get that. What do you think Biden is doing wrong such that he's he's slipping a little bit from where he was? Well, I think that the amazing stat came from a Washington Post poll, which found that just 38 percent of Democrats want to see him as the as their own party's nominee. Uh, that is the lowest uh, number among a, a president's own party uh, this going back uh, decades. Uh, I don't think there really is a, a precedent in, in the modern day uh, for that. And what's amazing about it is, is that is that we're now living in the kind of partisan media age where a party unity, party solidarity among voters is typically high. Uh, and they're typically told uh, over and over again that uh, there's a vote blue no matter who or vote red no matter who. So the fact that there is such, I think, a lack of confidence in Biden uh, as a, a, and a lack of desire for Biden as the Democratic Party nominee really speaks to some serious uh, problems. Uh, uh, I think what the Democrats are relying on is is that they'll nominate Biden. Uh, they'll try to uh, suppress any kind of primary challenge at all. The DNC says, says it's not has no plans to hold debates, even though there's uh, in one poll 28 percent support uh, combining RFK with Marianne Williams and 28 percent support for an alternative to Biden in a straight up head to head poll. So they're going to try to suppress a primary. Biden will be a nominee, and then they'll hope that disillusioned, uh, demoralized uh, Democratic voters will nonetheless enthusiastically turn out because they're repulsed by Trump or whoever the Republican nominee is. Uh, the danger, of course, is that that turnout won't happen. And so I think getting to, to your question, uh, I don't think Biden has focused very much on creating an enthusiastic base. There has been a pretty serious shift to the right since the American Rescue Plan, which I thought was a, a terrific piece of legislation uh, that, that boosted Biden's polls early in his term. Uh, but now you see him moving to the right on things like climate change. Uh, uh, he's abandoned the minimum wage push. Uh, he hasn't even mentioned his health care promises from from 2020. Uh, he sort of adopted some uh, Republican posturing on crime. I just think it's it, it's he, they're not focused on a get out the base kind of strategy that may be uh, important in a closely contested general election. I really appreciate that you come at this from the perspective of seeing this as the new formula for Democratic capital D Democratic politics, and that this really is what gave us Trump in 2016. When you're running against a candidate who is far right, many criticize as fascist, to me, as someone who's progressive, I think the solution to that is anti-fascism, right? To move things in the other direction. And as you've pointed out, we've got Jerome Powell, who's a worker-crushing Fed chair that Biden has kept in that position. How do you see uh, Biden's decisions while in office as hurting his re-election campaign more so than the platform he ran on the first time? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, the the Jay Powell uh, question is a, is a huge one. I mean, Joe Biden reappointed Donald Trump's Federal Reserve chairman, uh, and the Federal Reserve chairman has not only uh, tried to crush the economy with these incessant uh, interest rate hikes, but even, wor even worse, or at least arguably as worse, the, the lack of uh, regulatory oversight on Powell's behalf when it comes to the banks, which, which I think there's a lot of evidence for helped create now this slow motion banking crisis. Uh, and Biden uh, hasn't even 
even talked about uh, potentially removing j Powell, even though under the statutes, uh, there is a, a case to be made that that is allowed. I mean, again, we reported at the lever on uh, j Powell giving a and the Fed giving a, a stamp of approval, for instance, a Silicon Valley Valley Bank saying that it didn't pose a systemic risk uh, to the economy. Uh, that was uh, about two years before, of course, the effectively the bailout of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, so so Biden has that's one decision, reappointing uh, the Fed chair, uh, keeping him in place, even as he has, I think, fallen down uh, on the job. I mean, again, there's also the cutting off of pandemic aid. Uh, there's the ending of the child tax credit. Now, you can argue some of that is from Congress and 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 Joe Manchin. But ultimately, the buck stops with the president uh, and he hasn't been out uh, pushing uh, continuing to push uh, for a reinstatement of the child tax credit uh, or the minimum wage or a public health insurance option. So I again, I think that it's when you're running in 2020 on this formula, just get any kind of nominee to make it a referendum on the incumbent president. Maybe the formula works. But when you are the incumbent and the election is likely to be an in inherently a referendum on the incumbent, if you are not delivering in a serious way or seen as fighting to deliver in a serious way, it puts you in a very precarious position. Just the other day, Senator Bernie Sanders uh, signaled that he will not run again, that he is actually going to endorse uh, Joe Biden. You know, you're someone of the left. You've worked with Sanders in the past. How do you, you know, what do you make of this? Is the energy dissipating on, on the left in terms of having a viable political effort in place to, to push for leftist policies? Well, look, I, I think the over the last 10 years uh, uh, and maybe a little longer, the Democratic Party culture has become more and more hostile to the idea of any kind of primary challenge to anybody, uh, uh, any incumbent in office. I mean, that is up and down the ballot of Democratic politics. I think that is particularly acute uh, at the very top of the of the ballot. And Bernie Sanders, one of the attack points against Bernie Sanders uh, in 2016 and 2020 was that he had uh, politely raised the prospect uh, of the idea that it might be a good thing for Barack Obama to have faced a primary in 2012. That was seen as, a, that was used uh, subsequently as, a, as sort of an attack point. How dare Bernie Sanders uh, even mention the possibility of a primary to Barack Obama in 2012. What a horrible person was the what, what was the argument. So I, I say that to 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 point out that the culture of democratic politics has become a lot less small d democratic, a lot less uh, believing in the idea that contested primaries uh, are good for democracy, strength in general election nominees. Uh, and so I think uh, Bernie's uh, decision to endorse Biden kind of reflects that cultural shift. Uh, and and I, th I I would guess from his point of view, uh, he 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 sees this as as, as the reality and uh, a reality that's difficult to change. Now I, I believe it can be changed. I believe it needs to be changed. But I certainly think uh, there is this culture here of hostility towards challenging the democratic establishment. Toward there's a hostility towards believing in the idea of primaries. And and I do think the the I guess the the left part of the Democratic Party is particularly disempowered. And I think what's really fascinating about this is, is that even as the polls show that the country is more and more receptive uh, to uh, progressive policy ideas, especially progressive economic policy ideas, uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, at least at this point, a snapshot in time, seems to be less powerful inside of the Democratic Party uh, than it has been in a long time. Uh, and because the Democratic establishment has become more brazen in using its power, backed by big money, uh, to, to crush that part of the party down. Yeah, I, I like that you point out it's 38 percent of members of the Democratic Party. And when we think about voter turnout, at best, we have 66.9% of the country voting in a presidential race. So when I think about the type of candidate we would need to run, I'm always thinking about increasing voter participation, which is not something that is easy to do. And what we've really seen from Marianne Williamson is she's running on a pretty populist progressive message, but is not a candidate that progressives are wholly behind at this point in the race. How do you see her shaping this race in any way and as a candidate that could potentially bring voters out that have not turned out before? 
Look, I think it's good that I think Democratic uh, primaries are a good thing. I think they strengthen general election nominees. It's strange to feel like an outlier in saying that like that, like that's a crazy idea. I mean, I I guess I'm I'm old enough to remember the 2008 Democratic primary uh, where it was a brutal uh, back and forth primary between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And I think that process strengthened Barack Obama as a general election nominee. I don't think there's any evidence that tough primaries uh, uh, weaken general election nominees at the presidential level. I think we are living in an in, in an ahistorical time uh, where the idea of con- that, that contested primaries uh, are bad for the Democratic Party. That 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 is an ahistorical idea if you look back at presidential politics. So I think it's good that Marianne Williamson is running. I hope more candidates uh, jump in to make this a contested primary. And by the way, if if Joe Biden wins a contested primary, a really tough primary, that process will help battle test him for a general election. Let's not forget that in 2020, he didn't have to run uh, the kind of campaign that typically has to be run because of the pandemic. So there hasn't really been a battle testing of Joe Biden in a in a presidential uh, general election race where you have to go out Uh, and campaign across the country. So the primary process is supposed to be a kind of uh, a kind of test ground, a safe testing ground to make sure that the general election nominee is up to the task without a contested primary. It's a big risk. I mean, look, maybe the formula will work. I'm not saying it won't. I'm not saying that Joe Biden would lose in a head to head matchup with Donald Trump. I'm just saying the strategy of no contested primary, a president who is not focused on delivering in my view, on policy, real tangible results that will motivate a big turnout. That is a risky proposition. David Sirota, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks to both of you.